Too many who know the angles Uncover and untangle All the questions and the webs left out to tangle I'll be in 1962 Last Wednesday's afternoon They'll bend your ears with reckless self-abandoned oh, The amazing spider talk oh, The amazing spider talk oh, Come swing through the air Sit back and prepare for the amazing spider I'm Dapper Dan Gavazdan, and I'm the founder and editor of SuperiorSpiderTalk.com. And I'm mischievous Mark Chinacchio, the founder of the Chasing Amazing blog and author of 100 Things Spider-Man Fans Should Know and Do Before They Die. Well, thanks for joining us for episode four of the second season of the all-new Amazing Spider-Talk. We hope you enjoy this podcast and that it provides an intelligent conversation between two fans and collectors as we look at the Spider-Man comic universe in a bit of a bigger picture. Yes, sir. In this second season of the all-new Amazing Spider-Talk, we've been taking a look at how Spider-Man hit the big time during the Stan Lee and John Romita senior run on the book. Uh, Today, we're talking about more bad guys. I mean, we talked about bad guys last season, Dan, but now we're going to talk about the John Romita run bad guys. And then we're going to compare them also to um, some of the guys that showed up initially in the Ditko books and how they kind of were interpreted in Romita. It's just it's just another excuse for me to go the bad guys. All right. Well, we're looking forward to you going (laughs) the bad guys. And, uh, yeah, we'll be covering many issues in this run, which can be found in your local comic book shops. Always try to support them if you can on Marvel Unlimited at your local libraries and on Comixology. Well, you know, basically anywhere you can find comics, you can find most of these issues. I would think if you bought a copy of Amazing Spider-Man number 50, the first Kingpin, you really would be supporting your local comic book shop, Dan. (laughs) That's absolutely (laughs) true. So whether you've read these stories a million times or not at all, we hope you enjoy our episodes entitled... The bad guys. No, Mark, it's Ramita Rogues. You know, None of our characters, none of the characters I created were really based on real people. I've been asked that quite a lot of times, but it's, and yet it's impossible to answer any question definitively because while none of them were based on real people, I'm sure that every writer who writes any character is taking this character from experiences he's had, from people he's known, from other things he's read. Everything we experience is somehow stored in our mind. Even if you have a horrible memory like I do, (laughs) it's still somewhere in your subconscious. Mm. And I'm sure when I write anything at all, if I'm creating a character, in some way, it's got to be based on all the things I've seen and read and heard and thought of. But I never specifically say, I'm going to base this character on President Bush Mm -hmm. or on Charlie Chaplin. No. I try to come up with original ones. All right, Dan. So obviously the John Ramita Stanley run was a very uh, legendary run on the on Amazing Spider-Man. And Ramita himself, I mean, he's he was Marvel's art director and had a hand in creating a number of A-list characters over the years like Wolverine and Punisher and Luke Cage. I mean, he basically um, worked with the artists who were on those respected books at the times to kind of refine the uh, visuals. So uh, Ramita definitely had an eye for um, for character creation. But 
What's kind of interesting is when you look at these books, like whereas during the Stan Lee, Steve Ditko books, it was, I mean, basically every classic villain from Spider-Man's rogues gallery shows up in those books. Doc Ock, Green Goblin, Mysterio, Sandman, Electro, Lizard, so on, so on. The Ramita villains, I mean, they 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 certainly tried, but uh, I, I think the, the, the hit ratio wasn't quite as high, right? <laughs> Yeah, for whatever reason, you know, it makes me wonder if maybe that Stan Lee's writing wasn't giving him as interesting things to work with visually, but not so a lot of these guys have never really caught on, although they do pop up, you know, pretty frequently often in like kind of like disposable bad guy roles. Yeah, I mean, definitely, I guess they were supporting or tertiary bad guys. I don't know. I mean, there obviously there are a couple of big hitters here and we will we will get to those specific ones very shortly. Um, but it's it's yeah, it could be I mean, you know, this is when we talked about in the first season the genius of Ditko. I mean, there there there's something to be said here. I mean, Stanley obviously kind of did his Stanleyism of pitching just very general concepts of, of characters, but Dick goes the one who who made it happen and who made it work. And my understanding is Ramita was far more deferential to Stan when they worked together. It's probably why they worked together for so long. They got along great and I think Ramita actually enjoyed working with Stanley, whereas Dicko clearly didn't. But you know, what that did for the actual like original character creation is 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 you know, maybe not the greatest thing in the world, but kind of like what we did in season one, we're going we're gonna to break this down into, you know, A list, B list and and below. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> that A list is just not as heavy as the Ditko A list. So, um, you know, do you want to do you want to kick us off with with our first A list villain here, Dan? Yeah, well, I, I think the 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 one that's probably going to come to everybody's mind right away and is my favorite of the bunch is the Kingpin, also known as Wilson Fisk, the head of the, I, I, what do you want to say, the the mafia? Is, is there a name for his gang? Yeah, th- that's the thing. There really isn't. I mean, you know, in, in Marvel, you have the Magia and you have other gangs, um, but Kingpin is never really associated with a specific gang. He's just kind of the one who oversees all the families is kind of... Um, the the general description of him um the five families from the venom ink arc mark oh god <laughs> why why did you have to go ruin this for me um <laughs> but but here's a little here's a little factoid about the creation of kingpin that i i found very fascinating so you know we got to go into the way back machine to 1963 um stan lee had an idea for a villain um, and it was his original pitch to Ditko for the Vulture. He said he wanted a heavy set um, mobster type villain based on uh, the actor Sidney Greenstreet. And Ditko thought to have a flying villain look like a big fat guy was really dumb. <laughs> and, and rightly so. <laughs> I, I, I believe I believe Ditko's phrase was that would be a flying turkey. And and Lee obviously relented, probably because he was working on 20 other books at the time and just didn't have the energy to fight with Ditko on this. But Stan Lee was notorious in the 60s for, you know, if if something didn't work with one artist or creator, he he would find a way to get his idea to happen at some point. Like he he just he was persistent, probably, you know, sometimes to an to his advantage, sometimes to a fault Um, in this case. He was going to have his big fat villain and he came to Ramito as they started working on the book together after about eight issues and was like, let's let's do a big fat mob boss. And that was his Sydney Green Street. And and that's how we had the kingpin. I mean, and and it works, obviously. (laughs) Well, it's, it's the most distinguished looking character, I think, of all the various mob bosses that we would get from Stan Lee's you know, varied runs, you know, like you, some of the other ones had masks on or even capes that we'll talk about in a bit, but like there was something about that physique of the Kingpin that really made him stand out. Even if he was kind of like an awkwardly toe like character, 
you know, in, in his design. Um, with this, I always loved that he was this big dude, and he could punch, but he would also just zap you with his tiny little cane. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there was definitely some kind of 60s cult, you know, pulp spy novel type attacks to the kingpin which i i thought were interesting you know he seems like he's out of a james bond novel um the kind of guy that would have like thing in a flower you know like water or gas in a flower in his pocket that would shoot at you you know exactly yeah exactly um but he was he was a good mix i i, I it's like the it really is i mean the character would go on as many of you know, to have far more fame and authority when he got moved over to Daredevil during the Frank Miller Daredevil run. But I mean, even in these books, Kingpin Kingpin is not a slouch. He's not a pushover. I mean, in addition to having this very unique look, he's both physically imposing in a freakish kind of way. Like he, he, they establish that he moves quickly. He's very strong. I mean, he's got all that weight behind him. So you can kind of accept the fact that he could take a punch from a superhero and still dish it out and and be in a fair fight in that case, uh, which I think is a problem I have with some of the other uh, street level villains from this run. It's you know kind of a lack of credibility in terms of their strength. Kingpin has the such a unique look; you kind of buy it. Um, but he's also very smart. He's intelligent. He's organized. Uh, he's got kind of a, a a weird classiness to him, which again would kind of be exposed. Uh, later in his uh, comic book career. But overall, I mean, this is a very distinguished, distinct villain. Um, and, and not even just like the pinnacle of Lee Ramita, but, you know, it's a pinnacle of Marvel villains, I would say. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And while he did kind of shift over to Daredevil, even even now we still see him crop up here and there in the Spider-Man book. He's not been a forgotten villain of Spider-Man. Um Although I, I think Ultimate Spider-Man really found a way to kind of like really integrate him into Spider-Man's story in a way that these early Amazing Spider-Man issues never really could tie him personally to Peter in some way. Uh, not that it was necessary, but, um, you know, he would, in his different representations, I think that's probably the strongest version of him. Yeah, I mean, Bendis once gave a, an interview about his version of Kingpin in Ultimate that I thought was just spot on and, and really just a great um, interpretation of the character. I mean, he said that he always found Kingpin to be the perfect foil for Spider-Man because, you know, he, he represents kind of that old corrupt system, whereas Spider-Man was the idealistic, naive youth. And it's, it's very true, you know, like it's kind of not to get political, but you think about the, you know, some of the debates going on in the, in the world today right now, um, in, in the United States. And, and it is that kind of like, you know, new generation versus old generation. And, and can the, can the system, will the system ultimately win? And Kingpin represents that system. I mean, he was, um, in that ultimate run and specifically he was corrupt and a criminal, but, um, he also had like a very respected status in society, um, which is not as explored as fully here I, in during the Ramita years. I don't think he's the kind of guy that like owned a bunch of skyscrapers with his name on the side of them. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, could you imagine where that could lead today? Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> one of the other things I found interesting about Kingpin, not to draw even more like modern parallels, is this kind of like element of his family. And, you know, uh, we'll talk about his son in a bit, but he did have a way of kind of drawing his whole family into his crimes with him. Um, but interestingly enough, his wife, you know, would, would constantly try to pull him away from being the kingpin of crime and, and, and have him retire from, uh, you know, his work. And, and, you know, by the end of this run, you know, he almost has a little mini arc. Uh, mm. In this run where he does, you know, were lent to his wife's wishes, at least momentarily, uh, that he will be leaving crime. And, and there's that famous issue where he's going to kill Spider-Man at the end. And it seems certainly doomed. But, you know, Vanessa stops him at the last minute. Yeah, I mean, that that his love for Vanessa has always come across, regardless of who the creators are as being very sincere and authentic. And, and I think that even is captured right on the onset here, which just gives 
the character yet another element, another layer that um, a lot of villains, certainly in the 60s, didn't have. It's something that I miss from modern Kingpin incarnations. We don't have that Vanessa character anymore. And I, I think she'd be, you know, she showed up in the Daredevil TV show. And, uh, and I'm, I'm eager for Vanessa to make a return or a Vanessa Light character to make a return in some way. Yeah, although I don't even know in the Marvel Universe right now whether Vanessa's alive or dead or runs I'm pretty, the mob. I'm on... pretty sure she's dead. Okay. I'm, I'm it, not I, entirely I, sure. She she was died and came back so many times over the years in Daredevil books. I just I lost track. Um, well, remember in the free comic book day issue uh, of Amazing Spider-Man this year, Vanessa is brought back by the Jackal and the Kingpin snaps her neck in front of right. him and says, this is not my wife. That's right. You yeah. are right. And then I think just another thing to note here, just kind of a logistical thing here. I would say that, I mean, in addition to being this very unique, distant character, I mean, the Kingpin was more or less the main villain, I felt, of the Ramita Lee run. I mean, yeah, I, 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 Green Goblin was also very significant, but also like the Green Goblin's arc was just kind of constantly in the background i mean he gets exposed and then has his amnesia in the very first two issues of lee and ramita and and norman's arc is kind of being tracked very slowly in the background during this the entirety of this run whereas kingpin is just coming back and back and back and um, I mean, he's basically the center, the central foe and some of the main stories here, like Spider-Man No More and then the Stone Tablet saga, which kind of also branched out to more of the of the underworld, uh, criminal underworld in, in Marvel. So, you know, like like clearly Lee and Ramita knew they hit on something here and they wanted to keep focusing on him as much as possible. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I think it would be like for me, like a three way tie between him, Doc Ock, and Green Goblin, all who have, like, multiple returning stories in this run. Although I, I, I would think that Doc Ock has the most page count, if, if uh, my guess would be right, because he's got, like, three different stories he comes back for. Yeah. I guess you'd have to really sit down and, like, count the pages out. But, <laughs> let's, um, let's, but, let's do it, Mark. Let's cut, count those pages right now. Let's, let's just do it right on the, on the air here. That would be really compelling audio, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> so, so anything else about um, Wilson you want to talk about? N- not really from, from this run. I mean, he has such a history in comics at Marvel. You know, there's it's hard to kind of, like – once you start going down that road, there's just a ton to talk about with Kingpin, but you know, he, you know, he made his debut and, and you know, his deb- debut almost gets overshadowed by the Spider-Man no more story because right. it, you know, it's, it's such a bigger and more interesting thing than this kind of gangster, but I'm glad he hung around after that. You know, he could have very easily just faded away. Yeah. I mean, I like that he goes after Jameson in the first story. I mean, yeah, cause that true. was kind of, the untouchable at that point, you know, um, again, it just set him apart and, and, you know, we're, we're calling him a list here, but really in terms of this run, he's in a class by himself because, um, the other a list villain I'm about to get to here is probably very arguably a list. I would say, right. At least from this run, I think, I think like he's arguably a list because he's in what a handful of issues less than that. Yeah, two. Um, two yeah. yeah, so so we are talking about the Rhino uh, as the other A-lister from this run. Um, who he, he debuted in Amazing Spider-Man number 41. Um, and then, interestingly enough, took an issue off and then came back in issue 43, which is kind of like that big Rhino story from the 2000s that you love so much that was kind of separated by some time and space, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the that's the story that puts him into A-list territory for me. But uh yeah, I mean he's a big he's got a big splashy debut in this and the characters even when he's not in the book continue to talk about his presence, you know? Yeah. And that's unusual for uh these characters. And 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 that gap is unusual. Is that done with any other character in this run where we literally just take an issue away and come back? No, I don't think so. And, and, you know, in a lot of ways, those, those three issues, 41, 42, 43, they're all connected because 42 is where MJ is introduced. And, and then like MJ's first full appearance, like dovetails back into the return of the rhino. So it's all kind of like, 
loosely connected, but no, I mean, he doesn't appear at all in 42 and then is like, you know, all over 41 and 43. And um, I got a soft spot specific, maybe more so for the comic itself, because as people who've read Chasing Amazing over the years might note that um, the first appearance of the Rhino in terms of my comic book collection was my first um, major villain first appearance comic I ever came to own or like Silver Age villain, I guess you would say, because mm-hmm. I, I, I did have Amazing Spider-Man number 300 at the point that I had gotten this. But um, yeah, I was like at a comic book show and digging through a box and I found like the first Rhino for like 20 bucks or something. So I was like, OK, I guess at that point it was like the 90s. So people didn't care about the Rhino as much. Maybe maybe Sinister Syndicate fans did. I don't know. <laughs> wow. Well, there you go. And for me, as I've said on this show before, if I, if it wasn't for the Rhino, uh, I would never have gotten that John Romita signature because I had to know who was John Romita's first villain that he created with Stan Lee. And it's the Rhino. So he has that special designation in this run as well. Because it wasn't the Green Goblin, right? It was the Rhino. So... You know, he's got that special place in all of our hearts as being Romita's first Spidey villain. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's actually I, I think it's a pretty cool design. I mean, yeah, it's a guy in a rhino costume, but he's certainly big and physically imposing. And, and I mean, maybe in a lot of ways he's too big and physically imposing. He kind of ha- suffers from um, what I felt was like Sandman syndrome from the Dicko Lee run, which was like, he was too much of a heavyweight for Spider-Man and, and thus kind of had to be phased out uh, for the sake that it just wasn't really believable that Spider-Man would be constantly going up against this, this super heavyweight like that. Yeah, I can see that. I, that's what I kind of like about him is because it gets Spider-Man out of his element a little bit. Like, I don't think he had ever really faced anybody with this kind of physical threat before. Um, I mean, maybe the Sandman, but it's not portrayed in the same way that like he could punch the rhino a bunch of times and it wouldn't really, you know, affect him in any way. Unless uh, maybe the Hulk uh, is the is the only other instance of this that I can think of. Right. And then obviously, interestingly enough, the rhino went over to the Hulk for the longest time. I mean, that he he was almost not an arch nemesis of the Hulk, but he was a significant Hulk villain for some time. So they, they, I think even Marvel recognized that at least, at least initially it, there were probably better heroes, hero villain pairings in terms of Rhino and, and in the Marvel universe. But what do you think about like the Rhino's origin or kind of like creation myth regarding his kind of like impenetrable skin that stuck to his body? I always liked that kind of like, sick twist the same is true with the scorpion right he can't really take off the suit and so they're kind of tortured villains but i I feel like like ever since both characters debuts no one has ever stuck to that as like a reality of these characters existence uh and it bothers me because i thought it was a a cool attribute both like you know lee dicko and ramita brought to these two characters yeah, I mean these are these are bad people, but they're turned into monsters, and and it does evoke some sympathy. And you're right, it doesn't get explored as much. Although I am kind of incredulous in the in the second Rhino appearance, how Spider-Man's webbing is like able to dissolve the skin. It's like how does he how does he engineer that so quickly? <laughs> <laughs> the same way he got a reverse magnet, you know, machine that he invents in in Spider-Man Two. I guess so. I mean, it's it's pretty, pretty improbable, but there you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, are there any favorite Rhino stories that you have other than the kind of um, the rage of the Rhino that we talked about? Well, I, I would say um, the other big classic is, of course, uh, Flowers for Rhino from the Spider-Man Tangled Web series. I mean, that's kind of I mean, that in some ways is kind of a precursor to the to the brand new day Rhino story just bec- in terms of really trying to establish the character as being sympathetic and and um more than just a big strong dumb ox or rhino as you will but then after that i mean he really is just kind of a bit player i mean even in the books uh i mean i think he shows up in some of the b stories uh b books over the years like in spectacular and marvel team up but if you're actually gonna like track 
the character in Amazing Spider-Man, I, I think after 43, he doesn't show up again until like the 80s during like the DeFalco Friends run, if you can believe it. Yeah, that's one of those things where you read it all the way through that you're like, where did that character go? I know that he becomes famous at some point. He was in even in a Spider-Man movie, you know, so he must be one of the classics. But yeah, I mean, it, it, I don't. I don't know what it was, but he was maybe it was his time spent in Hulk that like kind of gave him some clout. But you know, in terms of memorable stories, you'd think like the Juggernaut was Spider Man's, you know, most classic big punchable yeah. bad guy because his story is far more memorable than anything with the Rhino. I'm I'm just curious like what it was that kind of got the Rhino back into the spotlight. I wonder if it was like the an animated series that like made him a more prominent character because he is so fondly looked upon, but really does not have that kind of comics presence. Yeah. I, I was just about to ask you the same question because it's, it's very curious to me. I mean, obviously there's that, that brand new day two parter that we keep talking about. But after that, I mean like all of a sudden he, he started showing up in the sinister six, uh, during the dance slot run. And like you said, he was in amazing Spider-Man two, the movie, um, so something at some point his stock jumped up out of nowhere for me. Like I, 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 I was kind of like, Oh, he, he's a thing now, I guess. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, he was in the nineties animated series and, you know, as part of the sinister six, he, he's been in a bunch of Spider-Man video games over the years. I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm curious to track the rhinos rapid ascent into Spider-Man's top Enough that we're giving him an A-list spot here. Yeah, because it feels oddly earned. I mean, I think anybody who ends up in a movie, for the most part, is either A-list or on the cusp of A-list, although the next guy that we're going to talk about maybe is debatable on that regard. I think the next guy we're going to talk about is A-list, but he's jokingly not. Yeah. And that, um, you want to get right to it? Yeah, let's talk about the shocker. Don't mock the shocker, Dan. No, I will never. Or he'll run me over in his shocker mobile. <laughs> That's the thing. I think if you have like a shocker mobile or like a Thanos copter, you're a list. Like once you get your own car, you know you're, you're you're up there. Yeah, but the problem with the shocker is all the appearances and all the pages that he gets mentioned in. Both, I mean, he shows up a couple of times in this run. I mean, his first appearance is Amazing Spider-Man number forty-six. Um, but he does show up a couple of times between then. But it's never like I think after this run, he, he's never portray, portrayed in a great light. And I have to think and you can disagree with me on this. I have to think the reason why he's kind of considered a punchline is this is an awful character design, right? I mean, I kind of like it, but we'll talk about why there's some confusion regarding it. Uh, uh, but yeah, it looks like he's wearing a couch cushion. And then I guess in the most recent superior foes of Spider-Man series, it's confirmed that it is a couch cushion. <laughs> I mean, thank God. Uh, <laughs> and also, I mean, like even his name, he's not like you hear shocker and you think he's using like electricity, like the electro would, but you already have electro. And what he's actually using is like, vibrations to i guess jolt people so is he the vibrator <laughs> is he, yeah right well if you look at his outfit it's a giant v like in the color and even his belt has a v on it uh so everybody has thought oh was he originally the vibrator that just makes sense they must have changed the name because you can't call a character the vibrator but actually uh you know there's a brian cronin comic book legends revealed article that says otherwise that like there's an interview with Ramita where he was just like, I designed him with the V I liked the V, but he was never supposed to be called the vibrator. He was always the shocker. And you know, I look, I don't want to call John Ramita a liar, but like there's two V's on a character that does vibrations. Like it seems pretty obvious to me. Yeah. These guys don't have great memories. Um, but if Brian Cronin has it, then there probably isn't, you know, like indisputable evidence to refute what Ramita said, but so we'll just continue to speculate, I guess. I guess I, for in my mind, he was called the vibrator, and and became the shocker. But either way, don't mock the shocker. He, you know, he is the shocker. Um, 
What do you think about those powers? Do you like the kind of uh, gauntlets? I, I mean, the, it's it's okay. I mean, I, I actually do kind of like it when Spider-Man fights a villain that has access to technology to beat him. Because, because I mean, even though Spider-Man does have super strength and powers, like there's always that science element um, to him as well. So when you have a character who's got technological advantages, like a vulture. I, I, I do find value in that. And I mean, and for the most part during these comics, these Lee Romita comics, he's not treated as a joke. Although like, you know, they kind of redo a lot of the beats from Spider-Man's first encounter with Electro when he fights Shocker in that first issue. It's kind of like, it's that classic learning from his mistakes story. But um, I always kind of found the Gordian knot that Spider-Man cuts through here to beat Shocker to be a little less compelling. I mean, he basically just webs <laughs> his thumbs. <laughs> it's like, that's why you can't use your your gauntlet powers if you don't have thumbs, buddy. It's like engaging in a thumb war is how you beat yeah. this guy, yeah. Yeah. No, I, that, that is dumb, and the visual of it is super silly, you know? Uh, just uh, seeing his thumbs tied back. And, um, you know, of course, kind of going back to what we were saying earlier about villains in movies i mean shocker does technically show up in homecoming i mean two shockers show up in homecoming that's right and and even by name it's not even like they're hinting at it like they do with matt gagan um gargan gagan gargan i always confuse it's, it. it's gargan gargan my bad but you know i just can't put him in a list dan he's he's too much of a joke now i mean I love the shocker, though. I got to be honest. When he shows up, it, I think it's thrilling. Uh, I mean, the, the character just doesn't have consistent portrayal. I mean, for every unscheduled stop, there's superior foes, right? Or, or or deadly foes. He's a he's a he's a coward and a joke in deadly foes or ultimate, where the character is just like a running punchline the whole time, right? Until he comes back and has right. one of the most like threatening uh, issues of the entire series, that's a, that's a favorite of mine. But uh, yeah, sorry, the shocker, you're B list, but we love you. Right, and then just to kind of show how far we fall, I, I this next one I'm putting B list, but I, I, even I'm even I'm questioning that right now, and that's going to be Silvermane. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who I can never keep track of whether he's dead or not. I feel like this character has been crushed more times than I can even begin to count. Yeah. I mean, I think his last appearance was as a disembodied head in Superior Foes of Spider-Man. <laughs> 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 who made fun of the Shocker. So the sh And the Shocker ended up having Dominion over Silvermane's head, so I guess that does rank Shocker over him, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. What a great team-up. <laughs> I mean, Silvermane, is, is, he's another mob boss, so the, this, this time the, the, the mob has a name. He's the head of the Magias. And, I, yeah, I don't <laughs> – why did I put a B-list, Dan? I don't know. Sell me or don't sell me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he's got his. I got a huge arc devoted to him, so at least in, in this run, he's like in rarefied territory, and he is presented very threateningly. Um, and he's kind of gone on to a bunch of different property. You know, like he's appeared in video games and uh, I want to say movies, but he's not, a and TV shows as like a major villain. He's gone on to have like a bit more life than like some of the people we're going to talk about in our C list. Or lower. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I'm actually kind of surprised he hasn't shown up in, like, Mar Marvel Netflix. Because he would be a very easy-to-do villain. Not not the cyborg version of Silvermane. <laughs> yeah, now that I think about it, like, the cyborg stuff, Dan Slott has not really gotten into in his run. There's not really been this kind of cyborg-y, spider-slayery stuff uh, go going on in Slott's uh, run too much. I guess he's had a little bit of it, but... Yeah, Silvermane is uh he's kind of been forgotten in modern books except for Superior Foes and and I can never keep track of what's going on with Silvermane. But yeah, he's an old dude that gets killed and comes back as a robot. 
Yeah, I mean, he. The, I think he initially shows up as a robot uh, in Spectacular in the 80s as like a foe for Spider-Man and Cloak and Dagger. So maybe if that Cloak and Dagger show ever happens, he'll be on that show. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> I could see them doing Silvermane as like the mob boss in the Spider-Man Homecoming universe because they can't use Kingpin right. for some reason, which you know eludes me. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. But uh, to me, the problem with Silvermane is he's just not as interesting as the Kingpin, and they're being asked to occupy the same space. Um, right. And so they had to make way for somebody, and Kingpin's the one who won that battle. Yeah, although at the same time, I do like in the Marvel universe that we have different bosses. That feels kind of organic and true. It really, I mean, you know, we were talking, does the Kingpin have a gang? And he really doesn't. Uh, so I kind of like that Silvermane comes in and kind of establishes like leaders of gangs in, in this Marvel underworld instead of just the generic mob. <laughs> you know? Like I think kind of putting a more specific name and personality to the individual uh, gangs uh, was a nice little touch that they did over the years. And then he showed up in Ultimate Spider-Man as well and was kind of like – quickly dispatched by the kingpin uh you know without any kind of ceremony so i guess that tells you what bendis thinks of silvermane oh well well what do you think bendis would think of some of our next villains dan (laughs) i don't know some of them have shown up in his books but uh but yeah uh we are now moving into the c list and again c is generous i think for some of these guys yeah so the first one we're talking about is you know goes along with that whole uh, animal thing, and you know, I bet Stanley just said to John Romita Sr., Okay, our next book is going to be about the kangaroo. And the first thing they thought of was, like, I guess this guy can jump high, yeah, and, kick? and he's got to be Australian, I guess. Yeah, so that's the kangaroo. I mean, what is there to say about this guy other than he's Australian, he's got a weird hairdo, and he can jump and kick? He's just got the dumbest origin, Dan. I mean, he literally is like, I and I'm going to do a really bad accent here. So I studied kangaroos and learned how to jump and eat like them. <laughs> <laughs> Although now there's all these like viral images of kangaroos that are super ripped going around on the Internet. And now <laughs> every time I see them, I'm like, all right, maybe that kangaroo guy was on to something. That's not a knife. <laughs> this is a knife. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, it's just it's just terrible. And um, I, they also have this like story that he was like in a boxing match. But like instead of boxing, he just jumped up and kicked guys in the head. I'm like, what? Is that even allowed? No. And, <laughs> and I mean, at least like when they did the grizzly in the uh, in the 70s, like, oh, he was a pro wrestler who wore a bear suit. It's like, OK, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to a limited extent. Yeah, <laughs> like this is just like so he was a boxer who would kick people in the head. And in this, I don't know if you reread this issue or not. I mean, you certainly, um, you know, wouldn't necessarily go out of your way to unless you wanted to just be super prepped for this show, Dan. But I, I, I in the fight that he has with Spider-Man, it's like there's never any doubt that Spider-Man could just kick his butt. But, like, the, the problem is, like, he's holding some vial with a plague in it. Yeah. <laughs> and so oh, yeah. I was just like, oh, I can't hit him too hard or he'll drop the plague. It's like, so, like, they're even acknowledging that this character, this character is, is, a, is a schmuck, basically. So just web it from him and then knock his block off. Yeah. So um, that's Kangaroo. Yeah, he does show up um, in Ultimate. He's uh, he's Miles' first opponent, right? And um, he is. Um, I don't know if he's like it's like Ultimate any better Fallout in Number Four. Yeah. No, he takes him out pretty quickly, and uh, like I remember one of his first appearances in Ultimate. I think he like kicks a table in half, like <laughs> like you do. Um, <laughs> I think it's in an ultimate annual that he shows up. I, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure, um, yeah. but I don't think he was ever drawn by Bagley. It was some other artist. So I think it was in an annual. But uh, you know, Kangaroo I, shows up every now and again, doesn't he? Like every like 300 issues or so. 
Yeah. And and like what's funny, too, is like every time there's like a an article about worst Spider-Man villains, he always ends up pretty high on that list. I don't know. I think that there are some pretty wretchedly dumb villains that followed Kangaroo, like post Ramita and Lee. I mean, he's he's more unremarkable than anything else. I mean, it's kind of dumb, but he doesn't even uh, have a costume. No, but like, I don't know. I would still put guys like Mirage and Mind Worm and the Grizzly and the Gibbon. Oh, over, my God. The Gibbon. Over Kangaroo. I mean, you know, and most of these are Jerry Conway villains. So sorry, Jerry. We love you. <laughs> Thanks for coming on our show, Jerry. Thanks, thanks. We, we, we got to have him back on to talk about the Gibbon. Absolutely. Uh, so next up is another guy without a costume, although his getup is kind of strange. So I guess you could call it a costume. It's, yeah, right. It's, it's man Mountain Marco. Yeah, he and he's basically the enforcer for the Silvermane. Um, and that's just kind of it. He's just a big dude who punches, I guess, and he, wears leather. Yeah, and he and he just like was like what, like three feet taller than Spider Man. That was his yes. thing. Yeah, yeah, but he doesn't. But he doesn't necessarily have powers. Like they don't say that. I mean, he's just a big guy who can hit hard. I guess. Um, I'd still. I find it I find it a little incredulous that he can stand toe to toe with Spider Man in this book. I don't know. Does that does that make me too too pedantic? No, they do their best to sell it. Like they are sure to reiterate it constantly and have Spider Man say things, you know, like, Oh, I can't hurt him and he's too powerful, but like you don't buy it for a second. Yeah, it's just I I, I don't know. Like I guess they kinda ended up doing that again with Tombstone, but I don't know. Again, the Tombstone had a very unique look to him that sets him apart. And I don't know, I think when a character really looks different, you can kind of believe that maybe there is something not supernatural, but extra special going on with him. But this guy, yeah, he's just a big guy. I don't know. And he looks like he's in a Judas Priest cover band. So um, (laughs) that's exactly right. (laughs) You got another thing coming. (laughs) (laughs) He did show up in uh, in the recent 2099 series, though, like, and not just like in an issue for like six or seven issues. He was like a major antagonist to take and down all, 2099. And we all know how great that book was. So the for Man Mountain Marco to be in that <laughs> that book, <laughs> that was a step in the right direction. Really sells the character down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So next up is a character that's like I, we couldn't really even call him by his like villain name because right. he would just be the vulture. But really, what he is, he's just a dude that stole the vulture's costume, and that's, yeah, that's... Blackie Drago. Yeah, Vulture too, man. Uh, yeah, another special villain to me because I think I've said this before. First, my first Silver Age issue with Spider Man was sixty three with the two vultures on the cover, and I was always like, wait. Who's this guy with the real vulture? <laughs> like, what's the deal? And then I read the book. I'm like, oh, so he just like stole his, sh- his stuff from from the cell. Uh, that, that's that's lame. <laughs> I kind of like this idea, though, that like, you know, this this kind of tech could be stolen and utilized by somebody else. I, I always thought that was interesting. And. To me, this kind of opens up that kind of uh, uh, idea that the Vulture could have a gang of people like him, whether it's the Vulturions mm. or uh, the kids that we saw in more recent Amazing Spider-Man. Like, this was, to me, is what kind of opens that idea that the Vulture could be more than just a, a guy. Yeah, I mean, it does make me wonder, though, and, and I, I, I don't have anything to confirm this because I don't think Blackie Drago registers enough for people to ask Stan Lee about him. But, um, you know, we talked earlier in this episode about the creation of the Kingpin and how that was kind of born out of Stan's rejected idea by Dicko for the Vulture. And, you know, I always wondered if, if Blackie Drago is kind of like Stan yet again, like showing like, you know, he didn't get what he wanted originally with the Vulture. And maybe he thought having an old guy, with these powers was dumb. And so he wanted to create another vulture, uh, a younger one to, to kind of counter that. But it, it just, the problem is there was nothing about Blackie that made him distinct or unique or exciting or compelling, except for the fact that he stole the vulture stuff. 
um, and they really don't give the character any service whatsoever. Well, don't give him uh, too little credit because he does put like a head cap on and change the costume slightly. <laughs> there you go. That's <laughs> his contribution is a vulture helmet. There you go. Well, you know, you're flying around and you're untrained. You need a helmet, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, that's Blackie Drago, um, the Vulture 2, if you will. Yeah. And then our next character also is, I guess, a guy of multiple different personalities, this being his first one. Who are we talk about next? We're going to talk about the schemer who um – if you don't really know who that is by name, and you probably don't, because I even every time I look at this run, I forget. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's where this guy comes in. That's Richard Fisk. That's Wilson's son who, you know, you can actually argue as Richard Fisk is probably higher than a C-list character. I mean, he's a significant character in the Marvel Universe. At one point, in fact, was probably going to be the Hobgoblin if the Falco and friends got to do the story their way. So there's that. I won't talk about the Hobgoblin for an hour, though, Dan. I promise. Please, um, God. But here in the Ramita Lee issues, he's this mob. Well, you know, f- w- f- the Kingpin's kid goes. They set this up by the fact that Kingpin's kid goes missing. Uh, he's presumed dead in like a was it like a ski trip or something? I mean, you know, like what rich kids do. Uh, <laughs> Very true to life, actually. Was he involved uh, in a political family in any regard? I, I don't know, but you know, at least he wasn't like a lacrosse player. Oh, God, I shouldn't have done that. That's bad. Uh, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so he's he's presumed like dead in the Alps or something. Um, but in reality, he uh, has come back as this competing mob boss, the schemer. Which is just a terrible name for a mob boss. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what that guy does. Maybe we should trust the schemer. Yeah, you know. Um, and then, like, it's just this very bizarre character design. I mean, again, like, at this point, we're starting, like, most of the mobsters, even the non Wilson Fisk ones, I mean, they're guys in suits and they're, they kind of, you know, they look like mafiosos. And this guy is, like, in a cape. And he's got like a racing stripe down his hair. And I, I, I just don't know what to make of this character design, Dan. It's like – and he's wearing an old man mask. Like that's the strangest thing. You know, like like you, you don't know that it's a reveal story, like that's a secret identity story until it suddenly is. And he pulls his face off and it's little redheaded Richard Fisk. Uh, yeah. Like – what a strange, you know, you know, we think so little of this, Mark, that you and I did a whole episode on the like identity reveals in Spider-Man comics and didn't even think to mention this one. Yeah, I mean, this this was really kind of low on the list, although, again, years later, um, Richard Fisk would be revealed as the Rose. And that I felt was, well, I shouldn't say it was necessarily built better. Uh, because that whole storyline from the 80s, again, involving the Hobgoblin, I'm not going to get into it, uh, was a bit of a mess in terms of the back backstage politics. But, I mean, the Rose was a significant villain. And again, like having the Fisk be kind of a more central criminal figure the way he was, but also kind of like fighting against his father's dominion of the mob world i i i i I like that story it's a you know it's a classic edible story but it works yeah i don't really have much else to add about the schemer it's like kind of a forgettable story and he has a cape and And he's got a cape there you go and a racing stripe now just the last one i want to talk about here in case anyone is like yeah but what about this guy um i kind of put him in the wild card is the prowler um, and the reason why he's a wild card to me is because he actually wasn't technically created by uh, Ramita. Uh, and this this issue, this episode is called Ramita Rogues. Um, but, yeah, he was actually um, initially penciled by uh, John Pascema on the few issues that he filled in for Ramita during the, um, the 60s. So we have the Prowler, although as an interesting wrinkle, um, there is a little bit of an urban legend here. I don't even know if it's really an urban legend. It's it is continu- considered fact that John Ramita's son J.R.J.R. actually proposed the Prowler in back in the day, except not really as how the character turned out. He just like like went to his dad and was like, "You should do a villain called the Prowler," and then like John 
carried that John Senior carried that back to Stan, and then eventually went to John Buscema, and then they did something completely different. But Ramita Jr. will tell that story in interviews that he's like, well, you know, that was kind of my first my first character creation. So there you go. It's a Ramita rogue, maybe. What do you think about the Prowler? I mean, he's kind of he popped up recently, kind of off and on. Uh, you know, he would start it out as like a. He's interesting because he's kind of the first bad guy, I guess. That's like kind of misunderstood youth. You know, like he, you know, he just he was kind of a good guy that made a couple wrong choices, and also the first non-white villain of Spider-Man's. Yeah, I mean, the book is becoming more socially conscious at this point. So to have a African American villain, but have him not just be a villain, villain, but like kind of like you said, this weird gray area in between guy. I thought that was pretty interesting. I, I actually really like and I like that Dan Slot called back to it on his run. This idea that like Spider-Man would befriend this guy because they're both kind of outcasts and loners in their own way. And like he would even like leverage that to like, OK, I need you to dress up as me <laughs> and pretend to be me uh, to, to buy me some time as Peter. I don't know. I like that. I, I, I thought it was pretty it's a pretty cool twist for the character and i wish we would have saw, seen more of it i i like the prowler i like hobie brown i think he, there's something pretty cool about him i was disappointed in kind of where that solo series ended up going i mean it really was kind of dull at the end of the day i like that series you know i wish it had a chance to stand on its own outside of the kind of clone conspiracy but i yeah i like the prowler too i think he's a cool character that's kind of underutilized before we move on to kind of some of the Dicko villains, I did want to bring back up um, Sam Bullet again because I don't know if he's like a villain per se. But, oh yeah, uh, but he's kind of a presence in the book. He's like an, a, a JJJ analog where it's like yeah. he's out to like you know he uses Spider Man in his campaign to kind of become the district attorney. So Sam Bullet's this guy that's running for district attorney. And he basically is running on a platform that's like anti Spider Man. Um, right. And he turns out to be a criminal himself. Um, but, you know, to me, this is the first kind of interesting political villain of Spider Man, which would become, you know, a little bit of a thing throughout the history of this book here and there. Yeah. I mean, he's very Nixonian. Uh, um, I mean, I think he even talks about law and order. Uh, the way Nixon did in the in the sixties and seventies during this time, um, clearly, yeah, this is when the book starts getting more, you know, ref, you know, real life referencing in terms of its politicos and the issues at hand. Um, and he's just awful, the Robbie in this in this run, right? Yeah, absolutely. Although he's a Gil Kane creation, so again, not really a Ramita character. Yeah. But it's of this time, so right. we can discuss. So just, just to kind of move quickly through some other stuff. I mean, we talked about these guys, obviously, last season. Um, but I, I, I do think it's interesting how Ramita treated some of the Ditko villains during their run. Because I feel some of these characters um, changed, some for the better, some for the worse. Um, I, I think starting with the better, uh, the first one, of course, is Green Goblin. I think... Um, you know, we 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 can talk till we're blue in the face about at the time how significant having Norman Osborn be the character truly was, and you know, was it really at all that big of a reveal at the time? But the fact of the matter is, once they made that conscious choice to make him somebody from Spider-Man's inner circle, uh, it really worked, and I, I I liked that that conflict and tension that just lingered throughout this entire run of the fact that Peter has this relationship with Harry. And then there's like his crazy father who he knows is the green goblin lurking in the background. It, it just really ends. It really adds this level of menace to the character. And, and in reality, the character doesn't show up as the green goblin all that much in this run outside of that first story. But the fact that it's he's, his presence is there the whole time. Yeah, every time he does come back, it feels like a big moment, too, right? It's always at some, like, peak, terrible moment for him to reappear, and he runs out and gets his memory back, and he's just there to, you know, terrorize everyone in, in, in some way, um, you know, e e you know, even down to the kind of drug episodes with Harry, which we'll, we'll talk about eventually on the show. 
Yeah, I mean, I I would say as a whole that that this is the run that established Norman Osborn slash Green Goblin as the nemesis, Spider Man's nemesis, right? Yeah, and then I would say like you know uh, Jerry Conway's ultimate decision with him, you know, locks the character in as like an all time great villain. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. But I mean, you know, without without the foundation here, because I mean, he's significant during Lee Dicko, but there's still kind of this campiness and gimmickiness to the character during Lee Dicko. And here it's like it's he becomes far more terrifying in much more subtle ways here, which is what makes the character so much more significant ultimately. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Doc Ock, I feel kind of the opposite about. Like, yeah. he was scarier in the Dicko run. I mean, it helped that he had the master planner moments, which were, like, all-time great. Although I don't know if that's necessarily because of Doc Ock and his presence. But here, he, like, I would say he really steps up to be, you know, he, he continues to be Spider-Man's main nemesis, but the stories involving him are just kind of goofy. Yeah, um, although we, we, we get a request from a, a listener, right, to talk about one of these stories. Oh, yeah. here's We got a voicemail uh, from our nine Red Goblin voicemail line. Let's listen to what our listener has to say. Will you talk specifically about that storyline where Spider-Man gets brainwashed by Doc Ock? Thanks. So, so Dan, after we got that call, you and I actually were debating what what storyline was being referenced here, and I, 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 I'm making the leap of faith here that he's talking about the four part arc. I think it's issues Amazing Spider Man fifty three to fifty six uh, during this run, which is when um, Doc Ock uh, is seeking the. I, I think it's another MacGuffin. It's the nullif- ultimate nullifier or something like that, and and Spider Man ends up getting brainwashed and and becomes gets amnesia um during this storyline and kind of falls under doc ock's power there is that great cover one of my favorite ramita covers of the daily bugle headline of spider-man joins doc ock and it shows the two of them i mean you know ramita could sure as hell draw a cover right (laughs) yeah no kidding i mean all all the doc ock covers are kind of famous from this run whether it's like him holding Aunt May limp in his tentacles or yeah. the reflection of the like sunglasses, uh, the close up on Ox, you know, face, they're, they're all pretty unforgettable. Definitely. But like you said, the stories, I mean, I mean, Doc Ock is still considered a threat, but like, you know, he's doing things during these stories. Like, you know, he's like courting Aunt May, which is like, and, and like, I mean, you could cl- technically say this goes back to Ditka with the first annual issue, but like, why is Aunt May always an idiot around this guy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. She just got a soft spot for tentacles. I guess so. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the 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 story with the brainwashing, ah, it's not. It's a fine story, but like, I I I, I think the most dramatic part of it for me is not even so much that spider-man is doing doc ock's bidding it's that peter basically becomes an amnesiac at the same point that he and gwen have like declared their feelings for each other so that kind of like you know he like disappears and gwen's all like where the hell is peter (laughs) i always just love that they like peter gets involved in the crimes and and they drive around town otto and peter in like a getaway car and I just always thought that was really funny, like for these yeah. two characters to be in a car together. I don't know why that's so funny to me, but it's a it's I, I find it a humorous visual. At least he's not in the shocker mobile. There you go. Um, but then, of course, Doc Ock um, would his profile would raise significantly a little later in this run when he kills Captain Stacy. So, I mean, they do kind of bring the teeth back to the character before it's all said and done. But uh, in the interim, I mean, you know, these stories are fun, but they're not they're not heavy in any way. They're not they're not master planner. They're not even like the, you know, the death of Betty Brent's um, brother or um, the first Doc Ock Spider-Man fight where, you know, he's ready to quit as Spider-Man because he gets beaten. I mean, it's you don't really feel that level of drama until the death of Captain Stacy. So just kind of interesting in that regard. 
And then we got the return of another villain, which it's like, to honestly, I'm surprised this villain came back in this run. Yeah. Like, to me, I'm talking about Craven. You know, Craven Ugh. would later go on to be a great, you know, pretty great villain for one great storyline. But he, you know, I, I think he could have e- just as easily have been lumped in with like, I think him and both the chameleon could have been lumped in with like the looter and been kind of lost for all time. Like yeah. I, I have a soft spot, you know, for all three of those guys, but there, you know, the Craven shows up here and is just as goofy as he was the first time. Maybe even more so. Actually, yeah, I was going to say, I'm going mean, to say like, more so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have, you know, the initial design is this guy in a loincloth who looks like Tarzan, which is totally goofy and silly and then you know the 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 added effect for this is nipple cannons (laughs) (laughs) laser nipples that that is is that only in this issue that that shows up like yeah i think so i mean and then of course the the infamous deadpool issue where he goes back in time he like mercilessly makes fun of the nipple cannons yeah I, I, did that show up in Superior Foes? I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I don't know. That seems like the kind of thing that would have showed up in Superior Foes. Um, yes. We, we, we did get a rare villain team up with him and the Vulture um, for whatever that's worth. Yeah. Is this is that the first, I mean, like villain team up we've gotten in, in the pages of these books? I mean, we've had well, multiple well, besides villains. Besides the Sinister Six? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, like in the proper pages of non-annual Spider- See, here's me making a case for not. I was gonna say, are you saying it's something that counts? Where am I going? I'm going down <laughs> oh this my God. rabbit hole. Uh, you know, discounting the one annual that we both definitely agree counts. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, have, did we get a, like a, a proper like team up between two villains in a regular issue of Spider-Man before this? I, I don't know. I mean, like you had like the enforcers kind of showing up um, with other villains during the Lee Dicko years. Um, but, yeah, I don't think like you kind of get you know, that classic like, w- you know, two against one thing until this story. So and, and you know, the Craven story, in addition to being made fun of in Deadpool, does serve as background for Spider-Man Blue. Um, for whatever that's worth. So maybe the legacy truly is there, but there for me, it'll always be nipple cannons. We talked a little bit about the vulture, um, you know, already, uh, you know, th- I guess, I mean, the Blackie Drago stuff to me is the biggest vulture story of this run. You yeah. know, he teams up with Craven. Um, you know, another character that like, they couldn't quite figure out what to do with this old man until kind yeah. of like much later. Yeah, it's the, it's very it becomes very clear um, as this book moves on past the Dicko run that yeah that people were just they just didn't know what to do with an old man villain like they 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 needed it to be believable but at the same token like Tomb Adrian Toomes just works as the Vulture I mean like he's the physical embodiment of the character um, and. Roger Stern, thankfully, in the 80s, figured it out and and made the character really compelling again. But we're talking 20 plus years of of like nothing. I mean, you know, we had Blackie Drago and then in the 70s, I think they made a third vulture. I mean, you know, it's it's they just couldn't get it to work for whatever reason. Um, So, um, yeah, not much to work with here. But here's someone who's who's, in my opinion, status was raised in this run. And, you know, Dan, I have a soft spot for this villain big time. And that is Mysterio. Oh, uh, yeah. Because, oh, yeah. Because this run has one of my favorite, not just one of my favorite Mysterio stories, but just one of my favorite unappreciated stories. You hear that um, Untold Talks of Spider-Man. If you ever want to talk about the madness of Mysterio two parter from this run, I think that's 66 and 67. Uh, I, I can talk your ear off about this two-parter. I love this story. Uh, and to me, this is like Ramita's art here and kind of showing the, 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 all the weird and crazy special effects and stuff like that is really what captures the, what makes Mysterio such a unique villain. Um, you know, there's less, less concern about his fish dome during these stories and just more about the psychological uh, torture that he can inflict on Spider-Man, and I, I love it. Um, and like I said, I just think it's a great, great villain. 
Yeah, I love Mysterio stories because it feels like Spider-Man suddenly goes into a different, like, style of book. Like, it becomes this kind of, I don't know if it's a monster story, but it becomes a lot more just stranger than than anything we'd seen before. And and what's surprising is, you know, Dicko is known for his kind of crazy imagery, but Romita, you know, who I wouldn't have expected that from, kind of delivers here. And, uh, you know, especially on the covers, the, the best being the giant Mysterio hands reaching over Spider-Man. I mean, what a cool cover. Yeah, definitely. So, Dan, I mean, not not technically villains, but just like a couple other characters that show up uh, in this run for the first time uh, that might be worth noting. I mean, not they're not supporting characters either, but like kind of one shot encounters. You had uh, Kazar of the Savage Land. Is that what it's called? I, I always confuse that one. Yeah. Um, you had Medusa from the Inhumans, which to me might might rank as the most misogynistic issue of Amazing Spider-Man ever. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, I mean that that's got such classics as women can never. What is it? Women can never learn to uh, to uh, to stop talking or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Like, Whoa, yeah. Peter, what's going on? Um, we got good old Quicksilver showing up to um, during the the Stone Tablet uh, stories uh, to with a hero versus hero misunderstanding um <clears throat> something that's a little more significant uh comic book historically was um uh black widow shows up here in her classic emma peel avengers costume for the first time in the pages of amazing spider-man so uh there there's another in terms of legendary character designs i would say that from Romita that would be rank very high on the list especially when you look at what the black widow was wearing prior to that yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's a fun issue, too. Uh, th- these are some of my least favorite issues of Spider-Man, these kind of, like, random characters coming to the Spider-Man universe, but that one's fun. Yeah, it's definitely fun, and, and like I said, I mean, that, that that's the look for Black Widow, so, you know, thank thank you, John Romita, for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, and then, of course, there's the Iceman story, which also, I believe, overlaps with... Um, the what's it the 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 Sam Bullet story uh, again another hero versus hero wacky misunderstanding they like that a lot especially with Spider Man and then they just made a whole book of it called Marvel Team Up in the seventies <laughs> and, and 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 this uh, cover to me is the least attractive cover of the entire run yeah is that is that even a Ramita cover or is that Gil I don't Kane? think so I think it's Gil Kane yeah yeah it's a very odd cover. Um, there, you know, the woman in it doesn't even look like Gwen, in my opinion. No, not at all. And it's like all yellow. It's just kind of a really like poorly designed and colored cover. Right. But I mean, the story of this, not not the Iceman story, but the bullet Robbie Jonah story. I mean, it's like, you know, that's a to me, that's a critical story in like daily bugleisms in terms of establishing those characters and kind of Jonah's um, interesting moral code that doesn't always get established until then. So, um, you know, it might be worth a read if you can get past the cover and the Iceman misunderstanding. Yeah. Don't judge a book by its cover entirely. Nope. All right, Dan, anything else you want to talk about with these characters here? I mean, I think we've got, we've covered just about every issue of this run in terms of what, what happened. I mean, this might have even been a good place to start. We we really got into mapping a lot of it out, but you know we've now covered heroes, villains, supporting cast. We've we've covered it all. There's a lot that started in this run. Not all of it is successful as Ditko, but a lot of it. It's a, a lot of fun. Yeah, and this is this is only four episodes in, Dan. So uh, what the hell are we going to talk about over the next uh, eight episodes? I guess this is the end of the season, Mark. All right. Oh, well. (laughs) (laughs) All right, everybody. Well, thanks again for joining us for our fourth episode of the second season of the all new Amazing Spider Talk. Dan, our next episode will come out in about two weeks. And what's the title of that one going to be? Yeah, it's going to be called Where'd the Webs Go? And it's going to be our discussion about the 1967 Spider-Man cartoon show that helped introduce the character to the world, even if he wasn't really dressed appropriately. Oh, 
goody. I cannot wait to talk about the same four buildings over and over again. <laughs> and, and I have to admit, I've not watched much of this show, so I'm going to be binging on this thing so that I can really give you guys a, a, a you know, like a thorough uh, understanding of it. So no better way for me to spend my spring break. Yeah, I mean, I, I unfortunately don't have a spring break, Dan, but I, I, I will try and rewatch as much as the show as I can. My, my um, there was a period I got the DVDs uh, for a birthday gift uh, five or six years ago. And I would say around the time my son was around three, he became obsessed with putting the show on. But he just liked the song and then liked some of the visuals, but never actually really wanted to watch anything beyond like the first disc. Uh, so, um, I gotta see like, oh yeah, there's, there's like a whole other, like 30 episodes. I, I probably haven't watched in about five years, so I might need to refresh myself. (laughs) All right. Well, that's great. And, um, you know, what, what if, uh, our listeners wanted to get more involved with our show in some way? Well, of course, you know, our Patreon subscribers, uh, be sure to check our Patreon page and your podcast feed uh, this week for uh, a special review of Amazing Spider-Man number 798. Uh, remember, for just $3.99 a month, the price of a new comic, you'll get access to our exclusive new issue reviews, Swarm B-Book reviews, extended interviews, mailbags, more. And then for $10 or more a month, you'll get access to some awesome commission artwork. Speaking of which, Dan, uh, I, I hear some of our Patreon subscribers are getting a special delivery this week. Yeah, absolutely. I'm surprised you haven't gotten it yet, Mark. I haven't. What's going on? <laughs> ah, well, it's got to cross the entire uh, continental United States, so uh, hopefully soon. But if you're listening and you don't have it yet, you know, keep a uh, keen eye on your mailbox, and you'll be getting a nice gift in the mail from us. Absolutely. You know, we we got that great voicemail this episode. Although we don't really know who it was from. So if you call in, please be sure to leave us your name and where you're from so we know who you are. But if you want to leave us a voicemail, why not just call us at 9 Red Goblin, uh, which we all know is the true origin story of the Red Goblin character. I'm going to say, you can't confuse the number now because you know, that character is everywhere. His first appearance is selling for what, like 50 bucks on eBay right now? So yeah, call us up. <laughs> Leave us a voicemail. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, this is a time where I say check out our our other shows. I mean, Mark and I aren't on them, at least all the time. And, uh, you know, the first one being The Ultimate Spin. You know, it seems like Spider-Gwen is coming to an end and Miles didn't get a solicit. So, you know, an interesting time for that show. Like, what, what what's going to happen? Where is it going? Yeah, we love The Ultimate Spin. Mark, what's our other show? Our other show, of course, is Untold Talks of Spider-Man, where um, that show analyzes some of the uh, lesser heralded stories of Spider-Man, which is like one of my favorite topics of all time. So, um, you know, again, I'm just pitching my 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 enjoyment of the concept. How about that? (laughs) Awesome. Well, if people want to hear more from you about some stories that you're heralding, where would they where do they find you on the Internet this week? Well, you can always find me heralding on Twitter at Chasing ASM Blog. And, of course, you can find me on SuperiorSpiderTalk.com. Although, Dan, I think you got the most recent review of Amazing Spider-Man or or I'm putting you on the spot and saying that here on the show. Uh, And um, you could, of course, get my book, 100 Things Spider-Man Fans Should Know and Do Before They Die from Triumph Books. Dan, what about you, man? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter as well, where I'll have the review of the new Spider-Man issue, as Mark uh, so aptly put. Uh, my Twitter handle is at SupSpiderTalk. And please come on and follow me. It's the best place to kind of keep up with Mark and I and all of our goings-ons. Um, you know, I, I was at WonderCon this past weekend and, and bumped into a bunch of fans there who saw that I was going to be there from my Twitter handle. So if you're not following me, you might be missing out on some of the cool things that Mark and I are doing. Uh, that's the best place to really follow me right now. So, uh, you know, let's close this show out, Mark, with uh, a motto we're always sure to remember. And what would that be? Yeah, of course, Dan. That motto would be, with great podcasts must also come the all-new Amazing Spider Talk. Spider Talk.